Hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the CCA and thank you for joining us today for a conversation with um, Annalyn Davis and Dr. Paddy Dimash. Um, so my name is Elia Ann and I'm the curator for the show Lightly Tendrils that's um, going on today. So today is the last day of the show which closes at 6. Yeah. So if you have an opportunity to <laughs> come and see it. Um, yeah, and Lightly Tendrils is a kind of two-person show with um, Annalyn Davis and Amanda Thompson. And um, it's examining their relationship up to the landscape with the works living in Scotland and in Barbados. Um, and so on this occasion, we wanted to initiate a conversation with Annalie and the connection to her home at the Walker Staley, which is formerly a plantation, and to facilitate the conversation with Dr. Peggy Brunesh, who is a Haitian-American foot historian and archaeologist to understand how the legacies of colonization and economies of growing the mono, monoculture crop, sugar cane in Barbados has influenced the way we eat and the global culture of food. And so I'll give a quick introduction of Peggy and Annalie before we begin a 45 minute conversation and the last 15 minutes for a QA and a with all of you. Um, so Dr. Peggy Brunesh is a lecturer in the history of the Atlantic slavery at the University of Glasgow and the first director of the newly established Beninga Center of Slavery, for Slavery Studies. Born in Miami to Haitian parents, she trained and worked as a historical archeologist with a focus on slave plantation studies, the African diaspora and the tra transatlantic slave trade, working on archeology span projects in Benin, West Africa, Guadeloupe, and various sites in the United States. Food is also central to Peggy's life and work. She acts as a culinary consultant for Perth's Scotland's Southern Fried Music Festival and has worked with multiple music, science and food festivals across the UK, providing cooking demonstrations and historical dining events for a broad audience. And Emily Davis is a visual artist, a cultural instigator and a writer. Her work is influenced by the experience of living and working in Barbados an island in the Eastern Caribbean that declared its independence from the United Kingdom in 1966 and most recently became a republic in 2021. Her studio located on a working dairy farm has operated historically as a 17th century sugar plantation. She considers the critical possibilities of her work from this post-colonial, post-independence context, engaging with concepts such as a post-plantation economies, landscape, racialization, counter knowledge, strategies for healing and repair, among other notions. In 2011, Annalie founded Fresh Milk, an art platform and micro residency program in Barbados. She has co founded several Pan um, Caribbean initiatives, including Caribbean Link, an annual residency in Aruba, Tilting Axis, an independent visual arts platform bridging the Caribbean through annual encounters with a fellowship program and Sour Grass, a curatorial agency focused on the contemporary Caribbean arts practice. Annalie's upcoming exhibitions include the Chardra Benali and the major commis commission from the National Trust of Scotland, exploring historical links between Scotland and our Barbados. So today's event is also being recorded and will be available in the coming months on the CCA website. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alaya, and thank you to the CCA, and most definitely thank you to all of you who are in the audience. Uh, I hope you're going to be okay with the fact that you're kind of eavesdropping in on a little bit of a conversation that we're <laughs> having. We wanted this to be a very informal, organic uh, dialogue that still connects to a lot of the the, the scholarly studies, the, the academic studies that we've been seeing, whether in terms of Scotland's um, legacy and connection to Atlantic slavery, the contemporary legacy associated with racism, and certainly um, another concern that's been on all our minds for quite some time, climate change and our relationship to the environment and what it is that we should be doing or are doing and considering its, again, connections historically. Um, 
I'm going to start with the first question, which is for any of you. Oh, just show of hands. Any of you made it down to the to have the tea ceremony with with Emily? So quite a few of you did. Again, Emily taking this different approach. And you went too. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> taking a different approach in how we can reconsider our place in the present, related to the past, related to our environment, place, space, personhood, and the difficult history associated with, unfortunately, Atlantic slavery, which is pretty much what brought many of us, well, the entire world to the modern era. Annalie, let's start with, with understanding the tea service. Um, I know you've talked to a few people about it. Could, could you tell us a little bit more as to why the tea service? What, what mm -hmm. brought you to that, mm -hmm. that approach? Yeah, thanks, Peggy. And thanks, Alaya, for the introduction. Um, so the work is called Bush Tea Services. The word bush is in parentheses, and that's kind of an important thing because it speaks to the um, kind of covert way in which bush tea is linked with Afro-syncretic religious practices. Uh, in Barbados, there's a term called obia. Um, maybe more people are familiar with the term voodoo, but in Barbados, it's called obia. And it's a kind of an Afro-syncretic religious practice that included bush teas, bush baths, and bush medicines. There were practices um, that would in have involved incantations, and the way in which those incantations were used would have um, kind of release the healing quality of plants. So the, the bush is, the reason it's in parentheses is because it speaks to the kind of the secretive nature of that, that practice. It's a practice which, which, uh, which was illegal. Um, I think it was struck from the books maybe in the 70s, if I'm correct. Um, and I'm interested in it because in some ways, me making work about that sort of addressed the impoverishment of my own education. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we part of the whole colonial project is really about controlling minds, and controlling minds means controlling what people read and understand about who they are and where they are. Um, and there can be a profound kind of dislocation from um, former colonial spaces because we don't understand a lot. Um, so I would say my understanding of African history, uh, while we were taught about the transatlantic slave trade, my understanding about African life um, and the Caribbean is really, a, you know, has been Africanized, um, was impoverished. So I was raised on a plantation. My father was a planter and um, I was born on a state-owned plantation that he managed. But I was taught to think about these plants that came up in former fields as to be weeds and mm. they were removed either using chemicals or by labor. Um, and then it wasn't an, until I started to understand, it was a book called The Wild Plants of Barbados by Professor Sean Carrington at UE, which kind of became my Bible because I started to understand that these plants had such significant value um, and not least of which their contribution to a more biodiverse environment. Um, so I started, as I walked, I have a ritual practice of walking in the fields very often. I, I live on this former sugar plantation that's a dairy farm, and I do a lot of walking, mostly at dawn. And I started collecting these plants and beginning to learn about them, um, and, and began to understand that these plants were really a living apothecary in the plot that was given to enslaved society where they had to grow ground provisions to feed themselves, but also they would develop a knowledge of these plants and those plants were used to heal themselves and each other. Um, the plot was referred to by Sylvia Winter as a pre-capitalist site within the larger capitalist machinery of the plantation. And to me, it was the space where the enslaved became human uh, it's where they passed on their tradition. They had an oral community, an oral tradition that they passed on to their community. And so the, the, then the, the natural development from the drawing of the plants was then to making this tea service. Um, it was commissioned by Cooking Sections in 2016. 
And I thought about coming to London for their Empire Remain shop exhibition on Baker Street, that this was a small, tiny act of reparation, that I would come to London and I would serve Bush tea um, as a discursive performative project where I would engage with an audience that would come into the storefront window and I would serve this tea, but I didn't serve British tea, which was grown on plantations in China and sweetened with sugar grown on plantations in the West Indies. I served tea made from plants that I harvested from the farm. And that particular brew included bay leaf, circe, lemongrass, and blue vervain. But as you've seen in the tea service in the exhibition, it's an imperfect tea service. So it, it has embedded in it these pieces of crockery from the late 17, early 1800s. They came over as ballast in the ships. And whenever I walk every day, they're underfoot. There are millions of them all over Barbados and all over the Caribbean. It's nothing peculiar to where I live. They're everywhere. Um, so it kind of then makes you think about soil as witness and soil as tomb and a holder of memory. Um, but as I served this tea <laughs> and started speaking about this shared history, I then realized that the English audience didn't know what I was talking about. Mm. And I found myself sort of repeatedly saying, well, but I've known you for 300 years. Why do you not know who I am? Um, and, and, you know, that, that project has generated quite a lot of interest. Uh, but that's kind of some of the background to that. It's interesting that you, you bring up the soil as uh, one that holds memory, a tomb, mm -hmm. in fact, which is it meant to be pejorative in, in that sense, or just it just is? It just is. I mean, uh, there's a scholar in the U.S. whose name slips me at the moment, but she, it, it, she speaks about this as like a virtual slaughterhouse that sits below the surface of the soil, right? So um, at one point in our history, the enslaved Africans were deemed not to have souls, and so their bodies couldn't be interred in the churchyard. Mm -hmm. So their bodies were interred in the villages where they lived. Um, so in some ways, it's everywhere is sacred ground, but we don't know <laughs> where, where this all lies. Uh, there's been one very extensive um, body of research by Jerome Handler, the Newtons, burial slave ground, which I think is the most known slave ground in the Caribbean with about 570 odd uh, bodies that have been interred there. So I think it's the soil becomes, it's, it's, it's a witness, it's a tomb, it's a holder of memory, but it also has the potential to be regenerative. And so when I think, when I see these wild plants growing in the soil, I think of them as performing a quiet revolution in the fields because they're asserting themselves 300 years later, um, having survived the monoculture of sugarcane mm. and sort of stating, we're still here and we can contribute to the biodiversity, which is so important because we lost most of it by the third quarter of the 17th century. So when you tried to have these tea services with the English and they really didn't understand what you were saying, but yet earlier on, you, know, you you made the point of the, the colonial project is one that controls minds, or the imperial project by extension. Certainly, it was about controlling black bodies. But still, the ramifications is that minds are still controlling the fact that this difficult heritage that is shared by so many is still not known mm -hmm. by technically the colonizer or the descendants of the colonizer. And yet... Part of what you do, part of what I do, is to retell mm -hmm. what has been hidden on purpose. Mm -hmm. But also that unearthing happens in a real, tangible, material culture manner, whether it be in terms of the artifacts that I excavate out mm -hmm. of the ground or the plants that served the enslaved communities in so many different ways mm -hmm. that you are now bringing forth to light. In your exhibition, you, you mentioned this, this dichotomy of erasure or absence and presence. Is that a bit about it? What is it you're trying to bring present mm -hmm. through your work? What is it? Um, 
I guess it's, there, it's another kind of understanding. I think when we think about Barbados and the history of it being a sugar economy, a lot of the language is around the economics of it. So the reason I use Elagia Page, for example, the drawings you may have seen um, in the big hall in the exhibition is a work called F is for Francis. And so the Ledger page, which is the, um, the, bookkeeping, the bookkeeping system that is the precursor to today's accounting system, the British Empire used globally. So those pages were everywhere. Um, and I'm interested in those because they tell one particular story mm -hmm. and it's about the economics. And they logged all of the information, how much rain fell, implements that were loaned out. Uh, and then, of course, in more recent times, because these pages are not that old, they're only from the 70s and 80s, it's the pay list to um, agricultural laborers. But what's missing, what, what the ledger page suggests is order, what's missing is the chaos, right? There's a whole lot of chaos. <laughs> so the plantation system comes across as a very ordered uh, imperial project, but the way in which it affected lives was chaotic. Hmm. Um, notions of legitimacy and illegitimacy, who belonged, hierarchies, uh, the control of women's wombs, who you were allowed to love, class, race, all of it. So part of the desire is to unpack some of those histories and to feel less alienated from the chaos that is the plantation. So I guess it's trying to bring to light some of the narratives um, that I think should also be on the ledger page. So interestingly, you're doing, through a different approach with your art, what I'm trying to do through archeology span and historical studies because the archive of slavery is one at best marginalizes the enslaved's mm -hmm. experiences, their voice, and at worst erases them altogether for control, right? That, that lens is from, it's a white lens, top down, and again, outside of knowing their names, right, that order you're talking about, their names, their age, how much they were physically worth for what right. labor they did, and, and that's it, generally speaking. But then it takes people like you and myself to think outside of the box and see the environment and let it speak mm -hmm. what, let it let us hear what isn't written down from the archives, the historical documents, those ledgers, um, I think is quite interesting, especially in terms of trying to revitalize or, or, or hear the, the experiences of the enslaved mm -hmm. and their descendants. Mm -hmm which when you do, it's such a vibrant, dynamic, mm -hmm. revolutionizing understanding of not just survival, but resistance, right. yeah. resilience. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about food, celebration and joy. Mm -hmm. Because in many of the plants that, that you've been looking at, there are contemporary communities that still use them. Mm -hmm. I know my mother grew up using right. particular plants right. that was grown in these, what were slave gardens that right. now are regular gardens. Mm -hmm. The foods that we were forced upon to eat, we relish still. We will not let go of breadfruit right. or salt fish, things like right. that. So there's an ability to talk about, interrogate the past, in a way that doesn't feel as traumatic right. to understand what happened. Right, yeah, so there was joy and was community joy. and yes. flavor and yeah, all of that. Do you remember any of the plants that, that she would have used in particular? Oh, absolutely, from her? absolutely. Um, almond trees, the leaf, the broad leaf of an almond tree, she would put castor oil. I don't know if it's the same in Barbados, but in Haiti, castor oil is the Primal. Yeah. greatest it's, yeah. medicine. It's yeah. good for everything. Yeah. I, the way cod liver oil used to be, you know, yes. many of you, <laughs> those of you who are old enough, you, uh, you remember? <laughs> yeah, I had that too. But castor oil, I know Jamaicans have a variety of it. Haitians have one. We would put castor oil on the, 
the, on the leaf, bam, stick it to your right. forehead with a bandana. Right. And that was how you helped your, your migraines. Yes. Um, sh- there was, I don't know the name of the plant, but I see it all over the Caribbean. And it has little pink flowers. And my mom would make a tea out of that. But I don't remember why. Mm. Because, unfortunately, I was an American kid growing up and just Rejecting. wanted to watch my cartoons, <laughs> eat McDonald's. I didn't want anything to do about the Caribbean. Right. But there were certain things that I have now understood. They were so far ahead and yeah. understood. Like my mom taking banana peels and soaking it in water in the fridge every day. And she would drink the water. And now I understand that potassium, potassium. fights high blood pressure. Right. And bananas yeah. are high yeah. in potassium. She was leaching the potassium from, yeah. again, things that, that our ancestors knew. Mm-hmm. And we've, in a sense, lost. Yeah. We've, been, we've been alienated, to use the term that you said, we've been alienated in many ways from the land that, is there to feed us, mm-hmm. to nurture us, mm-hmm. to heal us, and we're killing it. Yeah. I mean, I was, I've been thinking, because I'm also doing this project for the National Trust for Scotland and looking at the relationship between um, Scottish indentured labour and enslaved African labour in Barbados and wondering how these um, practices of working with plants here and coming to Barbados, these two systems of knowledge might have um, kind of rubbed up against each other and how they might have influenced one another. And as I've been learning about incantations that were used here and the use of charms and seeing that they have been written down for hundreds of years, mm. and there, there is nothing written in Barbados. I have spoken and written and communicated with so many people in Barbados to try and find... Uh, some kind of transcription. But, of course, when your sacred practice is illegal and you can be imprisoned or tortured or killed because of practicing your sacred rituals, these things go underground as a matter of survival. And and I think also because Barbados was a Protestant or Anglican rather than Catholic, Mm -hmm. um, the Santeria that has survived more in Cuba where you would kind of hide your African gods within the worshipping of the saints in Catholicism. That practice didn't happen as much in Barbados, and so Obia kind of went underground. And one of the tragedies is that we've lost a lot of that knowledge. I think the knowledge that has been retained is around the plants, the use of the plants, um, and how they benefited people in terms of health. So there were a lot of cooling teas, what we call cooling teas, so lemongrass you would take to reduce fevers and poultices that you would make, things for a broken heart. Um, You know, that was important, I think, things for a broken heart, blue vervain. Um, But that knowledge that exists today is still shrouded in secrecy, and unless you are a practitioner, that information, I cannot. I am not a practitioner. I'm not an initiate, um, so I can't access that knowledge in terms of the incantations. But they would have been used and they are still being used, but there's still this sense of fear around those traditions. Can you talk to us a little more about the the Scottish connection here? Um, Yes, it's it's well understood that uh, Africans were captives, enslaved, colonized bodies, but there are people who do understand and know that there were indentured servants who came, had horrible, mm-hmm. lived horrible lives, weren't slaves, but did live yeah. horrible lives. But if they survived, could have the the opportunity to possibly buy property right. and, and participate in the entire plantation economy by buying mm-hmm. slaves and, and whatnot. But as you say, there were quite a few that did come in the early what, 1600s, mm-hmm. 1600s, even going into the early 1700s yeah. that you were talking about coming in as uh, penal convicts right. and whatnot. Um, it's interesting that there isn't as much information mm-hmm. on them. So again, that is another history that has been silenced. Mm-hmm. And yet there's enough that you found that there is a Scottish or was, mm-hmm. don't know, 
Scot there was a Scottish tradition of, of sacred healing through plants. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to find that overlap, that, yeah. that interlink. What, what have you found in terms of the Scottish folk medicine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, one of the things I wanted to say is that in, in the little tea room downstairs is the Atlas of British Flora, uh, where um, there's a, I think he's a retired scholar, uh, David Dobson at St. Andrew's College here, wrote a book called um, Barbados Scotland Links, and he lists just over, I think, maybe two and a half thousand people that came from Scotland to Barbados. Of that two and a half thousand, only 152 were women. And I'm so glad I was those women because <laughs> it must have been hell on the ship. Mm -hmm. um, and of those 152 women, 15 were prisoners from the Edinburgh Correction House. And they came on two ships in 1663 and 1665. And there was a rioter from Glasgow in the mid-18th century called Janet Hill. Um, and I've been sort of imagining, because in the 1600s there was this issues around healing and witchcraft, uh, supposedly witchcraft. And I've wondered whether these women from the Edinburgh Correction House potentially were healers. Um, and in reading uh, things like Mary Beath's Healing Thread and the Flora Celtica and Martin Martin and all of these things, it's, uh, what, I've, what I've noticed is that there are some practices here where they use something like drift beans. So sea drift that comes in on the world's ocean current, sometimes on the sargassum that would show up on the west coast of Scotland. Some of these same drift beans would come in on the east coast of Barbados. Mm -hmm. And I sort of wondered if these people that came in as indentured laborer in such a foreign place recognize some of this material uh, that seemed familiar um, and how did they work with it in Barbados? I mean, there are traditions of fishing and kelping and weaving after the clearances, I understand, in some of the work I'm doing in Plockton. Mm -hmm. um, and on the east coast of Barbados, descendants of indentured laborers today are making fish nets and are in a fishing village. And um, I, I don't know that we're doing a lot with the seaweed. We seem to be inundated with it in part because of global warming and rising sea level and more um, chemicals in the water. Um, but the charms that I've done in the exhibition space are inspired both by these traditions of healing in the highlands and within enslaved society mm. and connecting organic materials with found pieces of lace and crochet. Um, there's a kind of an ecological angle to them in that they've kind of, they're sort of becoming secular prayers that are thinking about a more equitable um, environment. Because, of course, you know, my practice is coming out of the plantation and the plantation or scene, which is this um, part of the sixth extinction. And we're really on the front line of uh, climate collapse, which is really, I suppose, colonial collapse in some ways. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's been a, a kind of trying to connect um, and think about women who would have moved across the ocean in the 16 and 1700s and what would they have done? How would they have been inspired as healers by the natural environment? How, and how might they have moved in within the enslaved society? Because we like to think they're very separate, but they actually integrated. Um, and we know that because people had children across race and class. Um, so, yeah. It is interesting to think about the, the comparison and similarities that we wouldn't have immediately considered in terms of the enslaved and, and the land that they use to grow plants for healing. But the Scots also did the same. Had to. And yet there are traditions that I've seen since moving here that I think people haven't really connected, mm -hmm. such as how many of you know or have a rowan tree growing right. in front, yeah. always in the front, mm -hmm. right? It's in the front. And what's the reason? It's uh, considered a portal, mm -hmm. uh, protective. It's protective mm -hmm. from bad spirits. Mm -hmm. Berries from rowan trees are high in antioxidant and vitamin C, C yeah. which is what we take when... To protect our immune system. To protect our immune system. And we've, so right there, you, 
once upon a time had on your land your own chemist to protect you from yeah. the evil spirit, but obviously to protect your body, to heal your body. Mm -hmm. So again, it makes sense that indentured servants, particularly women, would have brought, brought yeah. that knowledge. Yeah. I mean, there was something I read, uh, I can't remember if it was in Mary Beth or Martin Martin, where they spoke about a practice of finding a cockerel with only black feathers, burying the cockerel alive under the soil by your front door in the highlands, and you would walk over it, and then your epilepsy would go. Now, people don't often think that Europeans practice these things, mm. right? That is something that you do in Africa or in the Caribbean. Right. But I, I, I mean, cockerels are used in Afrosyncratic rituals all the time. So I sort Still, of thought, yeah. well, there we go. I wonder if they did that tradition when they came to Barbados. And yeah. But again, as you've said, so much of this has been consciously silenced. Mm -hmm. So we, we are disconnected, we are alienated from, from that. Much of your work, as you've already been saying, that living in a, on an island, a small island like Barbados, is still, unfortunately, the front line of the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. How then does your work try to address climate change, if I may ask? Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of it is uh, I've been thinking a lot recently about the role of the overseer, mm -hmm. which is a very um, important um, person within the history of the plantation, and Scottish people would have come out as overseers. And there's a sense that maybe the overseer had an objective perspective on things, on land and on labor. But I, I often think that sometimes that uh, sense of objectivity allows for extractive practices. Hmm. Um, and I've been trying to think through the ritual act of walking um, that if we can have a more subjective relationship with the landscape, maybe we would think about nurturing it. Because one of the questions is, how can I have a more intimate relationship with the land that is so heavily mediated by centuries of the plantation? Mm -hmm. It is impossible in Barbados really to go anywhere and not be aware of the history of the plantation. It was Britain's first sugar isle. It was the where, where the plantation lasted the longest. It's where the 1661 slave code was written and exported to the rest of the region and the south of the United States. So it really, its impact is profound. And so I've been thinking that if through walking and moving my body through the landscape and collecting supposedly unimportant things, artifacts, plants, listening to birds, doing drawings, charting my own map, um, that there's a sense of caring for and nurturing and having another sense about the landscape that's not just about extractivism. I mean, you know, following on from the plantation now is tourism, another kind of monoculture. Mm. Um, and that is also a very difficult pill to swallow because I feel in some ways that it's gone beyond sustainable. Um, our entire south and west coast is pretty much marked by hotels and construction. So you can drive for miles and not even see the ocean properly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, there are issues we have now around food sovereignty. So thinking about the Bushti services is thinking about what grows in the environment and what we can use. We import 90% of what we eat. It comes through Miami, most of it. Um, so issues around food sovereignty, um, ecological justice, protecting turtle, ne turtle nesting beaches, mm -hmm. um, because I kind of have an expanded practice which includes writing, so there's some writing that also happens around around some of these issues. Um, but yeah, I guess it's really trying to think about another kind of relating to a kind of a traumatized place with a very difficult history of monocropping um, and how to care for rather than simply take from. Yeah. That's a very interesting view. There is the trauma 
that is still experienced by the descendants of enslaved people mm -hmm. because the contemporary legacies of racism are deeply embedded in our societies as structures. But then there's the trauma that Barbados is still experiencing of being a monocrop <laughs> society. Mm -hmm. Since sugar has, the sugar industry has, has fallen out for quite some time, what now is happening with the land outside of the land that's closest to uh, beachfront for mm -hmm. those, for the tourism, mm -hmm. um, right? The, the whole island was a uh, part of a monocrop society. So outside of the, the beach, front properties that are being used, um, exploited, re-traumatized through tourism by these new hotels and Airbnbs and whatnot. What is happening with the rest of the land that is not part of the sugar industry mm -hmm. anymore? So there's a very small sugar industry left. Um, a lot of plantation lands have been kind of abandoned. In, in their place, their trees river tamarinds, different things growing. So in some ways, we actually have a greater biodiversity for the first time now since the late 17th century. Interesting. Because these things are growing up. Um, we now have internal, because uh, a lot of the tourism development is on the coast, but we now have internal developments around polo fields and golf courses. <coughs> so you have these kind of Miami look-alike pop-up um, high-end spaces where you can buy a second home or, you know, short-term rent a place that's on this very uh, perfectly manicured um, golf course or polo field. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's so little coastal area left to develop, they're now developing the interior. I think what has happened since COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement is you're seeing some smaller farmers developing and those are both white and black Barbadians on a very small scale. I mean, maybe a couple of acres. And that to me has been kind of interesting because there's been so much shame associated with farming because of its connected to enslavement. Okay. So our first prime minister, Errol Barrow in 1966 said eventually that he didn't want to see a blade of grass on the island. There was shame associated with being, working the land. But I think now that there's I mean, you can now get some organic produce, like the place where we met at Eco Lodge, where the chef there is doing interesting things with sea purslane, which is something I grew up seeing. You would never have eaten it, but now it's on a fancy menu doing sea purslane in a, in a tempura batter. But isn't that also part of an issue because it's on a fancy menu? Right. Therefore, you must have the... The fine, the financial <laughs> wherewithal, yeah, to afford, yeah. to even go there. Yes, but you can find it in Cheapside Market, which is the market in Bridgetown where um, uh, many working class, but mm -hmm. also middle class Barbadians go to shop, and you will find it there. So it is being used in a particular way there, okay. but it's also being used in the kind of high end restaurants. Okay. Um, so I think we are seeing. Uh, there are more conversations about food sovereignty coming up. And just right now, in these last few weeks, our prime minister has been trying to form a food bridge with Guyana, uh, which should be like the food basket of the Caribbean, because mm -hmm. they have so much land in South America. Um, because we are very vulnerable when hurricanes happen and COVID happens and our entire commercial flights stop. You know, the shelves were getting kind of impoverished mm. because we import everything. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think we're beginning to see a little bit more awareness around those issues. But, so, again, as it sounds like, there's still a trauma associated with anything to do with the land, like farming. But if, there, if the land is being reappropriated naturally on its own, could... Is there no consideration to create your own food source with that land? Mm -hmm. Or is it still just too traumatic for, for Barbadians? Or is it just still easier to have a trade system with mm -hmm. Guyana or Miami? Mm -hmm. What do you think is 
is happening? Um, I, I think there isn't a lot of support for a lot of farmers, and there are also some other issues. There's issues of pradial arsony, so a lot of things are stolen, mm. um, and farmers are struggling with that. And there is an enormous issue with the African green monkey, which, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're growing. I mean, I, I have, you know, papaw trees and banana trees, and I harvest almost nothing because <laughs> they get almost everything. I took down my passion fruit vine because they ate all of them. Oh, no. Um, and that is a huge problem that the state has not figured out how to deal with. So there are also some very practical problems around stealing and, you know, the predatory nature of monkeys and as things develop and th their numbers are growing exponentially and they're looking for food sources. So that is actually a very real concern. And there's also... You know, the Ministry of Agriculture is not, it could be much more efficient. So sometimes somebody's growing lots of tomatoes and then the state decides to import them. So there's just mm -hmm. some mismanagement and disorganization. Um, but I, I have noticed certainly under COVID that small farmers were being used so much more and that, you know, so my choice is to work specifically with an organic farmer from St. Lucia and I buy all of my produce from her. It's, it's more costly because it's organic, mm -hmm. but I prefer to support her rather than the large supermarket chain. And, and I think a lot of people have been making those decisions and are beginning to value farmers more, you know? So before we open it up to, to the audience for their questions, I want to bring it back to your work and where are you going with it? Where, I mean, it, for those who've had the privilege to see your exhibition, and particularly the one on Francis and, and how you use the artifacts um, to even spell out her name, mm -hmm. a woman who obviously was unfortunately sexually abused. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. Um, you just need to read in between the lines. But looking at the work that you've done with Bush Tea Services, and, and lightly tendrils now. Where do you feel your work is moving in relation to these, these questions about biodiversity, climate change, our place and space on this earth? Mm -hmm. So I'm currently working on this project for the National Trust for Scotland that it's, that's exploring historic links between um, Barbados and Scotland. Um, that came about because I showed something called as if the entanglement of our lives did not matter. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that because it, it also brings it down to issues around women and reproduction. Um, and that's why the National Trust reached out because I was doing this work and so I was invited to, to collaborate with them. And as if the entanglement of our lives did not matter is a series of drawings and it includes... Um, I mean, there's one main drawing, which is a family portrait of a woman in a red dress, a little child, and uh, a man. Um, and I, you know, one of the things about the colonial project is women's wombs were being controlled. If you were black, they were being controlled in a particular way, um, usually by the master and having children because they felt they had ownership over their bodies. And if you were a white woman, your womb was being controlled to reproduce white bodies. So there was a resistance to um, loving across race. <clears throat> and so this portrait brings together these three people who were not allowed to be together because the man was a biracial man, the woman was from a poor white family, and this child ended up being given over to a spinster sister to raise. And then there's a series of drawings of wild plants and roots and parasites It kind of references Antonio Benitez Rojo's statement about Caribbean history is akin to a long annelid parasite moving through its bowels, which is such a mm. powerful statement that speaks to the extractivist history of the region. Um, and so I think some of the work is really looking at issues around gender, but also the power of plants. And so I'm, in addition to the, the, the work with the National Trust for Scotland, which is a small garden in Plockton that we just planted and opened yesterday with high school students, um, working with a herbalist in Skye to produce teas from those plants. 
Um, she'll come back and teach them how to make teas with the plants, mm. um, but also to make links with that garden to their own history, because their 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 history is kind of a British history, and they lose some of the Scottish specificities within wow. that curriculum. Yes. So we're using the garden to speak about a shared colonial history, um, and then I'm going to Dundee to work with Dundee Contemporary Arts to produce a limited edition set of prints that will pull out some of these issues. I'm really interested in these 15 women from the Edinburgh Correction House, so I'm hoping to find more on them. And then immediately after that, I'm working on a project for the Sharjah Biennial, and I've been given this incredible courtyard called Beit al Herma, which translates to the woman's house, and developing a, a living apothecary producing teas and then there's a small room where I'll do I think I'm thinking about the embroidery more because there's something about binding so those objects in the room downstairs where the organic material is attached using thread Mary mm -hmm. Beats healing threads it's in the binding and the incantation that the healing occurs and in Afro-syncratic religious practices, there's also the knotting at marriage ceremonies yes. and the binding. So the embroidery feels like maybe there's more to come there. And I think that the embroidery and the sewing is like this meditative act um, where you can contemplate things, where you can slow down. We spoke a lot with Alaya about when people come into the exhibition, we want them to look slowly, to pause, to have a drink of tea and just to, to calm down because the world feels so apocalyptic right now that I think part of the work is trying to slow down and in making slow work and looking slowly and reading slowly, um, I think there's gonna be hopefully a kind of a slowness and a pause in the work that reflects on some of these things. Well, certainly a, a restorative and healing aspect as well. I mean mm -hmm. to to have that opportunity to come in and not just slow down, but to be fed. Right. Yeah. Right? There is there is something deeply familial and and caring mm -hmm. in that to feed someone mm -hmm. and feed someone something that is going to heal them right. is profound. Yeah. When, as you say, we we feel so disconnected, so alienated. We, we're worried about everything. Yes. Um, are we even going to see next mm -hmm. year? And after coming out of lockdown and that disconnect we've had, that, that alienation from even our own loved ones mm -hmm. that we couldn't see, it is nice to know that there is an artist out here that wants you just to come in. And have a cup of tea. Have a cup of tea that, <laughs> that could heal you. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Anne. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you. <laughs> So at this point, we just want to open it up, and, and now, now, now that you are not interlopers, bring you in and and join in the conversation. Um, any questions for Annalie and, and for Peggy? <laughs> oh, okay, for me too. Thank you. It was just a, um, it, it was one of the ones you were talking about the trauma, um, about the kind of trauma that's locked into the soil, it's locked into the land, and the way in which there's a kind of movement of healing from there. But what I was interested in is when I was listening to um, Mia Motley, our Prime Minister, talking about the saltwater incursion, the threat of the fact that Barbados as an island might not exist much beyond 2050, which is only 28 years away, what, I'm, what I want to understand is how do people move towards healing with such an existential cloud hanging over them? And if you think about the salt water and it coming into the land, which then will make it infertile, where, where, do, where do we go from there? Yeah, that's a real issue because as a small island developing state, those of us in the Caribbean are being forced to reckon with increasing, increasingly furious hurricane seasons. Mm -hmm. So ours starts on the 1st of June. Earthquakes, volcanoes, COVID. And we are one of the most indebted country, regions in the world. Um, so it's very difficult to expect us to, to be flourishing and growing because these things are coming at us at breakneck speed. I mean, when she, Mia Motley is our prime minister, and when she spoke at COP here recently, 
um, and she spoke about just in Barbados, mm -hmm. not only did we have COVID, but we also had a category one hurricane, which took off a lot of roofs and it was only category one. Mm -hmm. We had the volcanic eruption from St. Vincent that dropped close to 100,000 tons of ash on the island that was a disaster. Um, we had a freak 90 minute storm with like 50,000 lightning strikes. It was outrageous. Um, and we have issues of water short. We're one of the most water scarce countries in the world. And then we welcome in, a, oh, I think over a million tourists and we're a population of just under 300,000. So I have no clue how to answer your question. Um, what I do think is gonna happen is that she will not serve again. This is her second and final term. And I believe that she will probably move to an international organization and that she will advocate on behalf of small island developing states. She kind of went viral at COP and, um, and I, I think that you know she's very articulate, she's an orator. She's very intelligent. She's doing also some things that I disagree with, which is more development on the beach. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. We're grappling with that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, on a smaller scale, rather than someone who runs a, a country like, like Motley, black folks find a way. We always have guerrilla tactics, whatever you want to call it, even during slavery as, you know, as Barbados was the epicenter of what was to develop in terms of race relations, legalities that centered on anti-black racism on so many different levels, places where people were only, their average lifespan was six years, mm -hmm. still found ways to bloom and grow in terms of culture, mm -hmm. religion, music, music, yeah. it still happened. Yeah. I would imagine, regardless of what new or continuous problems that are, are incurring, human beings have a way of adapting. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is it enough to share across an entire island or even globally? Mm -hmm. People will find a way. Yeah. We always have. Yeah. That's what that we're good at that. We can adapt. And if that means you are creating garden plots that are above the above mm -hmm. the actual land so that it's not yeah. um, infiltrated infiltrated yeah. by salt water, we will we are creative in that sense. The the question expands to is it enough? Mm -hmm. Right. Is it enough? Yeah. Liam, did you have a question? Uh, I didn't, but I was just, I, I can expand a wee bit on what you were just saying there, because I, 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 I totally agree with what you're saying. I guess my worry in relation to what you're saying is the people that control, um, who do they allow True. to okay. access these yes. new possibilities? True. You know, and, and I guess for me, the thing that's been interesting is uh, that's been the kind of undercurrent of the conversation and the undercurrent of, of, of your work and, and, and of your work. Uh, and for me, I guess the thing that, that, that's really vital and important is, is, the, is the work, the art work, mm -hmm. um, whether it's making the food or making the tea, almost primary to it is, is what that facilitates mm -hmm. and that's conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. And for me, the thing that was really key about what was said there was about when you made the tea in England and you started mm -hmm. a conversation and there was no knowledge mm -hmm. that you thought there would be about right. what that conversation yeah. was about. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess to get a question out of that is just mm -hmm. maybe share some of your thoughts about that experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it wasn't that long ago. So I was like a hardback old woman and I was so shocked Graham mm. I just couldn't believe that a place that we knew so much about could know so little about us <laughs> you know when everything all the wealth that came out of Barbados that was used to furnish and build museums and galleries and libraries in England and when that independence you know moment happened and the 
colonial relationship finished, there was no pot of money left for us to do that kind of stuff with. So I, you know, have done the crazy thing to choose to be an artist and return to Barbados and live in a country where there is no national art gallery and no contemporary art museum, which is like insanity. So this work, which is so much about where I come from, nobody gets to see it because there's nowhere to show it. And just the absolute shock that we were taught repeatedly about this place. And I, they, of course they knew who we were. And I just could not. And it didn't happen once. It happened over and over and over again for the whole time I was serving tea there. So that, I have to say, really threw me into a kind of a, well, I messed my head up, I have to say. It was very shocking. Um, that kind of got repeated again in the Netherlands with some curatorial work that I've been doing with my colleague Holly Bino through a platform called Sourgrass and taking the work of Jasmine Thomas Garvan to Institut Mali and realizing the complete unawareness of that history. It, it is just so shocking to me. Mm. So, I, yeah, we're still grappling with that. Um, yeah, that... I have to say, ready through me for a loop. That's a common thing, though. Even to put it in a very simple metaphor, uh, downstairs always knows everything about what happens upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> upstairs knows nothing of the lives yeah. of those living downstairs. Yeah. I just didn't expect that. Yeah. Uh, I was so shocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But even asking the kids at Plockton High School yesterday, you know, what do you know about the transatlantic slave trade? And they haven't been taught it yet. I'm told they're going to get it in their curriculum next year. We're working on it. But, yeah, they We're haven't been it. taught it yet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but we all have yeah, a lot to learn. Yeah. Is there another question? I think also <clears throat> with the exhibition, when <clears throat> you're discussing about the knowledge and, like, the inability to know about histories and because it's kind of hidden from us. One of the intention is also to kind of, instead of just knowing the world, there's a way to s bring about a sensing as well. Mm -hmm. that we want to try and bring out through eating. Like, you know when you say about the practice of soul food, mm -hmm. that, you know, through like the history of eating and- What's some, the consuming? Some, some way of just like navigating all these, that there is a way to be a kind of tenderness and a gentleness of sensing around the world that will allow us to know these mm -hmm. histories. Yeah. Instead of going through the kind of like journeys and threads of like education or like things, mm -hmm. like it's true. Yeah, so maybe that was also an intention of bringing about the teas and like mm -hmm. serving and. It's another way of. Yeah. It's an experiential kind of learning. Right, yeah. a kind of psycho effective way of like. Right, like going that about you're consuming. History you're consuming violence. history. You're literally eating yeah. history, and there's something that is far more real. As human beings, you know, we can be so right. myopic and we need to understand it by physically embodying it or touching it, right? Yeah. That's the first thing we learn as babies is you learn the world by seeing and touching, tasting usually, right? Always putting things in your mouth. We don't really outgrow that. Right. And it is one of the best ways mm -hmm. to embody fully. Yeah. Uh, what is often a very theoretical, too far in the past right. sense. It's, yeah. it's, it's a, a much easier way to digest mm -hmm. difficult yeah, content, content um, heritage, but that embodying of the consuming of history in that manner, I find extraordinarily powerful. Mm -hmm. And obviously you, you do too, that mm -hmm. people find the key. I get it now. Right. In a way that your traditional way of learning, reading, yeah, like or being looking taught. at a spreadsheet with exactly. numbers is very different to being moved by a piece of music or a film yeah. or a work yeah, of, of art. Um, like I think the F is for France. This work, some people have responded to just, just the story of this one person, you mm -hmm. know, who's been named in a will. Um, uh, you know, you can connect at a human level to that kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rosie. Yeah, I think that's just such a good, that I just want to have like a further thought about that and how I think in a lot of your work, you kind of speak back to like these colonial systems of knowing um, in such a like 
beautiful and really subtle but very powerful way at the same time. Because all the, as you kind of said way at the beginning of your conversation, so much of the way that the colonial system worked was in colonizing people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a huge process involved in how we then sort of like decolonize our own self. Mm -hmm. And given that the colonial system emphasized certain ways of knowing, mm -hmm. and those ways of knowing were primarily through beating, you know, and like separating the mind from the heart and the soul, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of like enforcing that duality. Mm -hmm. and bringing that duality or that separation to the places that the British colonized and creating education systems that fostered that and erasing forms of indigenous knowledge which mm -hmm. were based on like a more sort of embodied way of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think your work, particularly with the tea ceremony, like kind of counters all of that mm -hmm. because you're putting us into an embodied situation. Mm -hmm. we've, we've learned through this multiple senses, but we've been so conditioned to learn through like reading and our like we're very Right. Um, and detached emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I think the process of like drinking and tasting and you know, what does it feel like to have warm liquid going into our system? All of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff I think is maybe I don't know if you conceptualize it but that way, but that's certainly how mm -hmm. you know something that I feel really comes through in your work is yeah. kind of speaking back to like a colonial yeah. way of knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way you yeah. say it it's 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 um embracing the chaos. Right. Yeah. Right? That emotional Mm -hmm. the feeling of too many senses mm -hmm. acting at once is part of that chaos yeah. that that unfortunately you know coming out of out of that that Georgian period of no 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 we will detach emotionally that the only way that anything makes sense is if you detach it right. from your emotions right um, from from the senses right that we can study it in a particular way and right. and it will be the truth right is quite interesting. And that's why I think that the work is about intimacy, mm -hmm. right? Because the colonial system, it, it, it ruined intimacy and in so doing fostered madness. There's a lot of madness in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. right? You, yeah. you can't live under that kind of regime of terror and not have madness yeah. so, and, and, and cognitive dissonance. So the, 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 the issue around intimacy is about knowing the land, knowing the plants, knowing your history, knowing yourself, connecting, 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 connecting uh, because it's a history of disconnection. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what the arts can allow us to do, to connect. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a very practical question about whether you find people here who are working with plants and magic. Um, well, the Tarika, who we worked with to produce the teas, um, is working with plants. And then uh, the person who I just worked with uh, yesterday, Jeanette Taylor, who is a medical herbalist on the Isle of Skye, has a lot of um, knowledge around practices connected there. And the first kind of healers on Balmakara, who mm -hmm. worked for Lord Seaforth. So that kind of history, um, and going back to the Druids. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, and some people coming in and just having small conversations, talking about their own interest around plants and so on. Yeah, of course, I think there's practitioners out there as well. Mm -hmm. Rather than the history, I think people are still practicing it. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Right, yeah. So I think they're still out there. Yes. Yeah, there's the little store, I can't remember the name of it, Aliyah, where I went to get the nettle. Oh, it's across the bridge. The Woodlands Herb. Yeah, the Woodlands yeah. Herb. So there, you know, and, and you will find in a lot of places where you go, you will find stores that are selling things that um, people who maybe have a connection with African rituals. It may not be very obvious, but mm -hmm. it's there, you know. So there, yeah, there it's definitely there. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has it. If not, we can no? rock on. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much, you, Emily Andy. Davis, for this <laughs> profound sensory into your work, your practice, your ideas, where we should be going, could be going, how maybe we can all think about our connection to the chaos. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what I'm gonna walk away yeah, with. Yeah, that's a good one. 
<laughs> the connection to the chaos yeah. and 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 ground myself in it and not be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you again Thanks. to Alaya, our art curator, Alaya Ang, and certainly to uh, CCA and to all of you for coming out this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.